Good morning. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. We have uh, a number of different webinars coming up over today and tomorrow that support the ISO 19650 series of standards. Before we get into that, I just want to talk you through how to ask questions on the GoToWebinar platform. Um, you are all in listen-only mode. Um, this session is being recorded. Um, and so if you don't want to be a part of that recording, please do hang up now. For those of you who are still on, it will be recorded and uploaded to the YouTube channel next week. So to ask your question, type it in the question box um, and we will answer it at the end as the panel Q&A. Please avoid the raise hand option um, unless it's something critically important purely because that won't be uh, managed as well as the, the question tab. Um, as mentioned, we have a number of different webinars taking place today and tomorrow. Uh, parts A to F, uh, you can see here. Uh, this morning, we've got Andy, Rob and Sarah who are talking us through part A, um, and then Emma, Marcia are also on at 12 o'clock with John Ford on this afternoon. And then tomorrow we have Jack and John presenting part E and F as well. So they're all there. With that in mind, what I will do now is play a short video that introduces um, the ISO 19650 guidance work. So bear with me while I just play that video and we can take it from there. Welcome to this webinar about the guidance supporting the BSEN ISO 19650 series of standards. The UK BIM framework is supported by BSI, CDBB and the UK BIM Alliance. I'm Sarah Davidson. And I'm David Churcher. And along with Anne Kemp, we're co-editors of the ISO 19650 guidance. The guidance is supported by a group of dedicated individuals who give their time and expertise for free. These individuals might be authoring or providing feedback on the content. And you can see that David, Anne and I work alongside them in the management, editing and publication of the guidance. We also work closely with CDBB who lead on the presentation of the guidance. The ISO 19650 series currently comprises part one, two, three, and five. Part one covers the overall concepts of information management using BIM. Part two is specific to the delivery phase, design and construction of assets. And part three covers the operational phase. Part five sets the requirements for the adoption of a security-minded approach to information management as a whole. ISO 19650 part four is currently under development and it's due to be released hopefully in early 2022. The guidance was first published in April 2019 in the form of concepts guidance. Part two guidance followed in July and has been subject to update and expansion every quarter since then. We welcome and encourage feedback from the whole community as this is fundamental to shaping the direction of the guidance. So if you have feedback on the guidance, please do email us on guidancefeedback at ukbimframework.org. The fourth edition of ISO 19650 Part 2 guidance was 160 plus pages long, and this was clearly becoming unwieldy. And some of the key feedback from industry was that we needed to make the guidance more accessible. So in July of this year, we developed a new guidance structure that you can see here. We now have part one guidance setting out the concept of the ISO 19650 series overall. Part two guidance considers the specific requirements of ISO 19650 part two, and part three guidance, which has only recently been released, is starting to explain the requirements of ISO 19650 part three. In addition, we have guidance parts A to F, which are intended to cut across the whole of the ISO 19650 series mm -hmm. and they cover key themes where detailed guidance is considered necessary. 
guidance for part five will be developed by the Centre for the Protection of National Infrastructure, CPNI, in due course. So guidance A covers the information management function and resources. It considers the activities that need to be carried out and offers a resource map supporting the information management framework. Guidance B covers open data and building smart topics. It will also cover COBE, but this section is not yet written. And guidance C covers the common data environment in terms of workflow and technology. It looks at assignment of metadata as required by the National Annex to ISO 19650 Part 2 as well. Guidance D is all about information requirements. It explains the fundamentals of what they're trying to do and the details of different types of requirements with some very detailed examples. Guidance E currently covers the BIM execution plan in supporting tendering and appointment activities. It will be extended in due course with content to cover more tendering and appointment resources. And finally, Guidance F covers information delivery planning. This includes the responsibility matrices and the task and master information delivery plans. It also has space for guidance on the Federation strategy but again, this is not written yet. We hope this provides you with a little insight into the development of the guidance, and we'll hand you over to the more detailed guidance discussion just now. Thank you very much. Yeah, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Hopefully you can see my screen. Um, thanks for joining us this morning. My name is Andy Bootle. Um, I'm Keir and UK BIM Alliance and the co-author of section one specifically, so the information management function. I'm Rob Jackson uh, from Bond Brand Digital. I am a co-author of section one alongside Andy. And I'm Sarah Davidson from the University of Nottingham and I've developed the content around resources in section two of Part A guidance. Brilliant, thanks guys. Um, so we, we, each of us will just talk you through some of the key um, takeaways, I suppose, problem statements that we, we tackled in the, bit, the parts we authored in this um, guidance. Just before we get into that, a couple of um, important points just to make really. Um, so the guidance isn't supposed to be a substitute for reading the standard itself. Um, it may sound like an obvious statement, but please don't feel, you know, you do need to read this alongside the standard, otherwise some of it probably won't make sense. Um, and actually, it's, it's realised to me, when we were authoring this, um, it was based around um, part two, ISO 1963 part two, in terms of the information management function. Um, but actually a lot of the topics um, are, are absolutely wholly relevant to part three as well, where the same exists uh, for the operational phase. Um, but obviously the examples that we've given in this guidance are based around uh, the delivery phase. So the information management function. Um, now, before we actually talk about how uh, the ISO defines the information management function, we thought it was important just to reiterate as an introduction um, you know how information management generally is is an important thing um, and it's often overlooked as something that just happens in the background with no real um, accurate definition and assignment of who's who's carrying this this uh, information management out on projects um, and, and especially as we move into um, deeper into sort of digital ways of working we're now managing a lot more information because um, along with traditional documentation we've got structured information or data that requires a, a, a proper focus and a structure to managing uh, to actually get some of the benefits out of the back end. Um, and again, we touched on some some of the sort of key uh, enablers or, or benefits if if this is set up and done right, which you can see there, um, and it's stuff that many of you will already be aware of: improved coordination and communication, better quality of information production, more timely delivery, uh, mitigating rework and unnecessary waste effective informed decision making and more accurate record keeping and audit trails and again I guess that last point is important in terms of the context of the golden thread and, and all of the building safety legislation that's coming out you know we need to understand and manage information appropriately 
Um, and again, when you when you start to sort of think uh, at a higher level, fundamentally, information we produce about our projects and our assets is used to make decisions, and and decisions, good decisions, lead to better outcomes. So it kind of brings you back to the, you know why would you not have a focus? Why would this not be an, an important topic um, of managing information properly? So for the information management function itself, what what is it? Um, best way to describe it, I found I arrived at was it, it is the the collective responsibility and authority of the of the information management process um, so when you look at ISO 9650 part 2 specifically and as I said it is relevant to part 3 as well all of those clause activities in the ISO are the the whole process um, and that the information management function collectively um, oversees all of those and it's about then assigning who who does what um, in terms of the process so we developed this um, figure two here from the guidance which um, is based is an interpretation on figure three in ISO 96650 part two um, and this for me helped me to sort of visualize two things um, in terms of accountability of the various clauses who's responsible or who's accountable actually for those clauses being carried out. Um, the ISO uses shall, you know, a, a part, uh, whichever party you are, you shall do X, Y, and Z. Um, so looking at the color coding of these court clauses, it just shows you quite visually um, who fundamentally is accountable for those, those activities happening. Um, Rob will talk a bit more um, in his part, but there's three terms, there are three words that it's important to understand. So accountable, being accountable means you're ultimately got the responsibility for something carrying out, but you could discharge the responsibility to a another, um, of which case you'd have the authority to be responsible for that, that activity. So that, that helps to kind of picture um, the various clauses and who's responsible and accountable. And, and also it helps to articulate that a lot of these activities are at a project level but actually the far by far the majority are actually at an appointment level <clears throat> excuse me and again it is really important to reiterate you know the very, when you're engaged on a project the first time you're engaged in the project the very first step um, should be to then look at your information management function uh, for your for your particular organization start to understand the context purpose scope and then assign out the various responsibilities um, and accountabilities to your project team members and or third parties. So then the next problem statement, and again, this wasn't obvious to me quite honestly when I first started digesting um, the ISO, you know, can there be multiple lead appointed parties? Uh, and the answer to that is um, absolutely there, there, there can, and, and the vast majority of the time there, there often will be. Um, and we tried to give a couple of examples in the guidance um, to highlight that. So, for example, as you can see there, you know, at any one stage in this example, you've got a, an architect lead appointed party, a main contractor lead appointed party, and a client's project manager lead appointed party. Um, so, so, and there's many examples of that. It could be a client appointed design team. So those they they could be it could be the architect, um, the structural engineer, and the building services engineer. Um, at an early stage, each are lead appointed parties directly appointed by the client. So then again, looking at the ISO in terms of the resources um, that need pre preparing by a lead appointed party, um, that table indicates it as per the ISO. So there's a number of um, resources during the tender response phase, and then these are then firmed up and additional resources during the appointment phase. And then we got thinking, well, you know, is that actually practical and, and in terms of yes it would be in terms of an architect or a main contractor but a client's project manager you know are they actually going to be expected to produce these things as a lead appointed party um so on the whole yes because if you think of a bim execution plan essentially it's actually a method statement for how you're going to deliver and exchange information um a client's project manager is delivering information albeit is proportionally less complicated and involved as a delivery team um, but fundamentally they are delivering information um, the only two things we thought quite honestly that wouldn't apply in, in the example we gave is if it's a relatively small project the client's project manager maybe one or two people in, a, in an individual team um, therefore there wouldn't be a requirement to produce a detailed responsibility matrix 
um, because it's just a single team of people um, or indeed lead appointed party exchange information requirements because they're not appointing anyone internally or externally under that initial team. Um, and then in, in the context of the, the master information delivery plan, it's, it's one team producing information. So effectively, you could think of that as a task information delivery plan, but the rest of the resources, best practice would be required. And again, it's really important to re remind ourselves, you know, it's, it, it does need to be proportionally applied uh, depending on scope. So you wouldn't expect chapter and verse for, uh, of, of these, these resources and documents in, in the context of a client's PM. Um, so then moving on, in, uh, we also try to g give examples of how you might approach um, expanding Annex A in 9650 Part 2, which you can see on the left, which is, is a nice way of, of a simple racky matrix of assigning out who's responsible, accountable, consulted and informed for each, each clause in the ISO. Um, but for me, that's probably more at an organizational level. So we thought it was important to thinking of, uh, you know, when, you, when you're appointed as, as uh, whatever, in whatever scope you are on a project, it would probably be useful to expand this out um, as an internal document more than anything to try and then um, assign responsibility and accountability across your team members. Um, the example on screen was one we did for, for example, a building services subcontractor and again, expanding on the, the clauses and then the tasks that may be making up activities underneath each clause, um, and then listing out the project team there across the top and typically who's accountable and responsible. Because again, I think it's really important to get across that, you know, the, the, the purpose of changing to an information management function and, and moving away from the PAS uh, information manager roles is to, you know, this some of these tasks and activities need signing across the team everyone needs to play their part and it's not always going to the BIM specialist that you may or may not have on a project everyone needs to play their part so a, a useful example hopefully to how you might approach that uh, something Rob and I want to do is actually develop this into a, a, a full resource across all of the activities uh, as a tool that could be could be used ahead and again it's we, we got a little bit confused quite honestly when drafting this but realized soon realized talking with John Ford who's authoring the um, uh, authoring guidance part F and he'll talk about this tomorrow clause 5.6.2 which is all about generating information that is firmly dealt with the various responsibility matrices and, and information delivery plans so yeah so in, in terms of going into the detail there uh, we wouldn't do this as part of the information management assignment matrix okay Rob. Yeah, thanks Andy. So um, Andy touched on this a little bit earlier in the uh, webinar uh, and talked about accountability and responsibility and I think it, it's one of those things we kind of use the terms a bit, we use the term responsibility quite often when actually we mean account, uh, accountability. And we had a long discussion as part of, uh, of editing this uh, with Sarah, David and, and Anne and talked about what these terminologies actually mean. And um, they're often not described. And I think I've made the mistake, um, I can safely say I've made the mistake of, of not necessarily truly understanding this. And I think the guidance is there to um, flesh out some of these problems that we as a team sort of um, recognise we probably needed to know a bit more about. Um, and David Churchill really suggested that, you know, the, the, the sort of acronym of RACI, um, responsibility being at the top is actually it's easy to say, and that's probably why it was written like that, but actually we should think of it as accountability being sort of above responsibility. So the accountability, when you go back to the assignment matrix, is almost fixed every time. So when, it, for example, it says uh, establish um, the project's information requirements, the appointing party, which is effectively the client, um, that is always fixed and, and can't be changed. But as Andy said, responsibility can be delegated to somebody else to help uh, undertake those, uh, undertake the function or, or the tasks that sit below them. So it's important to understand that, um, you know, the responsibility and accountability might be done by the same party, but that responsibility can be moved. Uh, consulted and informed is slightly um, e easier to understand, but we wanted to be clear in the guidance about what these terms actually mean so that we get assignment matrix uh, and ultimately responsibility matrices, the matrices that are a bit clearer. Next slide, Andy. 
Thank you. So um, one of the other terms that's used in the uh, in ISO uh, 19650 Part 2 is this term uh, probity arrangements. Um, the first thing we had to do was go and have a look in the dictionary and find out what probity arrangements really means. Uh, and I think in very simple terms, probity arrangements is really about conflicts of interest. So um, you could have a scenario where an architect is being as uh, is lead appointed party. Uh, and, and they are uh, accountable and responsible for uh, the delivery of, of the project. And they uh, also undertake the information management function. Uh, and so they're effectively checking their own work. Um, this doesn't mean you can't do this, but what you have to understand is that there are clear divisions between somebody producing the information. So within an architectural practice, somebody is producing the drawings and models and documents, but somebody else is responsible uh, for, for checking that information. And providing you put in place clear um, workings for that, that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, you know, another scenario is where we've seen the same organization on the client side uh, and also on the contractor side. And again, providing they're different individuals, it doesn't mean that the same company can't perform that role. Again, you just have to have the clear boundaries between those. Next slide, Andy. Thank you. Uh, the other thing that's covered uh, in the guidance and on also the ISO is about competencies. So in the information management function, somebody, uh, somebody or, or multiple people are going to be performing uh, roles to to undertake that information management function and so it, it comes down to individuals and what we've suggested in the guidance is that those competencies can be managed or, or assessed if you like under technical um, capabilities so you know can they actually use certain software and also non-technical aspects particularly around behaviors and, and and dealing with people problem solving and so on so these competencies would apply if you're doing uh, if you're a client and you want to do information management uh, within your own organization or if you want to look at um, outsourcing uh, to a third party uh, so how you would assess those competencies of individuals but it is important to understand that competencies can only be applied to individuals and not organizations but you could have a series of individuals performing uh, or, or collectively meeting the required competency uh, across an organization next slide Andy. Thank you. So um, one thing that's close to my heart as a, as a consultant is um, we're often uh, appointed as a third party, uh, either to clients and contractors. And through that work, what we've often seen is people asking for BIM or BIM level two, or can we do COBE? And I'm sure many people on the call have experienced that. But what we need to be clear about is when, you know, when we're appointing a third party, and it's no different to appointing an architect or a contractor, we need to be clear about what we're asking uh, that third party to do. So what we've suggested is best practice, and the same this happens uh, on, on any projects currently, but the idea was that we put out some best practice about what you would include when you're appointing a third party. It, technically, uh, an information manager could be seen as a lead appointed party, but what we're clear about here is that they don't have quite the same uh, responsibilities. And, and the most important thing on this, probably on this list, is, is the tasks and what tasks you're asking them to perform from that information management function. It links very closely to um, the assignment matrix. So even if you were to list a, a whole bunch of tasks that perhaps weren't ultimately what you're gonna apply on the project, at least then you can get comparable uh, fee proposals back from uh, those third parties and you've got a chance then of, of comparing like for like. Often this doesn't happen at the moment and clients say, oh, I've got a very uh, a much cheaper fee from another consultant and that's often because they're not pricing the same thing so this is about providing that consistency and trying to get this both from a client appointing party point of view and a leader point of party that we should be putting in place much more robust processes in order to um, get third parties to perform that information management function uh, over now to uh, sarah Thanks, Rob. Um, so moving on to ISO 19650 resources. Um, the ISO 19650 series references resources and content that should be created for um, successful information management using building information modeling. And we refer to these as resources and not documents because they may not take the form of documentation. And we want to make we want to um, don't really want to shoehorn you down 
developing documentation when maybe a database would be more appropriate or a point on a, on a system. So information management content, it could actually be combined with other design and content uh, construction project content as well. But I think there are just two points to take care of. One is, is not to incor incorrectly promote a resource to an appointment contractual one, which isn't one, and we'll look at that in a minute. And the other is to author the resource at the right level. Um, so when we look at resources in a moment, we'll see that resources are authored at an appointment level and at an, uh, a project level. And what we don't want to do is elevate an appointment level resource to a project level resource. So if we just move on, Andy, to the next slide. So as I said, we have activities per project and we have activities per appointment. Uh, and we've also got resources at that level as well. So if we refer back to the diagram that Andy showed earlier in the presentation, we can see that um, all of the resources that are generated through clause 5.1 um, are project-wide resources as well as, um, uh, sorry, and then when we get into 5.2, we start to move towards appointment uh, specific resources. So if we go on to the next slide, what we're wanting to do with the project level resources is to provide a degree of consistency. Now that consistency will be across the client's organization, particularly if the client has a number of assets, but it's also about creating consistency across the whole of the project and the likely multiple delivery teams that will reside within that project. So we want to make sure that when we look at the image on screen now, it doesn't matter which delivery team you're in, the client can be assured that the information that exchanged is, is exchanged is going to be identified in a certain way, is going to follow um, a certain way of representing status and so on. Appointment level resources are specific to the lead appointed party and its delivery team. And this is a, a key point to be aware of because what we're trying to do, what the ISO tries to do through these appointment level resources is uh, make it clear who's responsible for generating information and, and not really to confuse that generator, the, the, the party generating the information with information that might be generated by another party. So if, if you're familiar with PAS 1192 part two, this is quite a significant change where we're, particularly when we look at exchange information requirements, that are targeted to uh, a specific lead appointed party appointment. So if we move on to the next slide, when you look in ISO 19, uh, the guidance part A to ISO 19650 part two, uh, there's a table towards the back that identifies each resource and whether it's a project level resource or an appointment level resource. And very often the title will give will give it away because it's referred to as a project something project information standard. Um, but we can see there that we have got appointment specific resources, um, exchange information requirements that I've already mentioned, uh, tender evaluation criteria, um, and also the pre-appointment BIM execution plan. These are all specific to that lead appointed party or the prospective lead appointed party. So just moving on. So many of the resources identified in ISO 19650 part two support tender and appointment activities. And most of them end up as appointment resources. And what I mean by that is that they have contractual significance providing they've been bound into the appointment correctly. But some resources are generated for information to enable an activity. And a good example of that is the detailed responsibility matrix. So that effectively acts as a stepping stone between the high level responsibility matrix and the task information delivery plan. Andy, if you can just press. So, so some information, so, sorry, some resources uh such as the projects information standard and the information production methods and procedures although they're drafted by the appointing party so they're drafted by the client 
The prospective lead appointed party does have the opportunity to review those according to ISO 19650 part two. And as part of their pre-appointment BIM execution plan, they can propose changes to those uh, project level resources. So it's worth recognizing that the content of those particular resources may change, but where it does change as a, as a client, as an appointing party, you've got to be cognizant of parties that might already be generating information according to those resources. So there are three ways that we can look, or, or sort of three segments to the resources. There are those resources that form invitation to tender resources, and those that form the tender response, and those that sit in appointments. And there are lots of there are lots of resources, and the relationships are uh, not necessarily straightforward. So what I would say is that. When you're trying to get your head around these resources please do refer to guidance a and look at the resource map that's contained towards the end of it so if we look at this uh this the slide now we can see that we've got um these tender resources that ideally will go into all um tender packages for prospective lead appointed parties so they're generally project level resources except for exchange information requirements and um, tender response requirements and tender evaluation criteria. And then the prospective lead appointed party will review these and they, they provide their response um, to reflect what the client has asked for, but fundamentally they're going to include their, their pre-appointment BIM execution plan. And they're also going to um, include a summary of their uh, delivery team's capability and capacity. Now, bearing in mind at this point, they may not really know uh, who is going to form the majority of their delivery team. So some of this information is tentative at this stage and it's to provide the client with uh, an informed picture of how that lead appointed party, should they be appointed, will manage information. And then if we move on to the next slide, we can see that um, the resources start to cascade through appointments. So the image that you're seeing on screen now shows the lead appointed party appointment resources and then an appointed party resources. And we can see that uh, the project's information standard, the information production methods and procedures, uh, the resources like such as those, they actually flow through, so they uh, they cascade and they're consistent across the whole delivery team. The appointment uh, resources in, in the form of the BIM execution plan, that's now been firmed up. So it goes through this process of being firmed up whilst the appointment is defined. And then as I mentioned earlier, at this stage of firming up the appointment, um, as a lead appointed party, you'll develop your detailed responsibility matrix, but it doesn't sit within your appointment. It's there so that task information delivery plans can be developed. And then once you have task information delivery plans, uh, the master information delivery plan can be um, developed as a result of that. So if we just move on to the, the final slide. Um, I think Andy mentioned earlier about the, the language of the um, ISO and it uses to, it, it tends to use either shall, which is an instruction to do something, or a shall consider, which is a recommendation. And it's worth always being mindful of whether you're being instructed or recommended to do something. And it's, it's really clear when you look at the pre-appointment BIM execution plan and the BIM execution plan that eventually ends up in as an appointment resource. So um, when you look at the pre-appointment BIM execution plan, it's it's recommending content that as a prospective lead appointed party, you'll put into your, uh, your BIM execution plan that's going to form part of your tender response. But when you're actually being appointed, the ISO is very specific about content that should be included. So it's made that leap really between a recommendation and something that shall be included. So that's a, a, a sort of a brief whistle-stop tour through the resources. And I, I would really urge you to 
look at the guidance and look at the resource map so that you can just see the relationships and the cascade of resources from um, tender package to tender response and into appointment. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Andy, and thank you, Rob. So to those of you who are listening, you still have chance to ask your question through the questions panel. I have had a few come through. So um, let's start with the very first one. Um, this is open to all of you. Could you elaborate on the post-contract beam execution plans? In the guidance, you suggest that multiple lead appointed parties provide multiple BEPs. Wouldn't it bring confusion to the project? And would it be better to have one party develop the BEP together with the rest of the project team? <laughs> That's that's a really good question, and and we we that was exactly what we were scratching our head and and deliberating and discussing um, on as we were writing this. Um, and I think if you we, we did cover this a bit in the guidance, in that yes, you think that in the world of back in eleven ninety two world, um, and that's what happened. But if you think of a BIM execution plan, like we said, as a method statement, and actually that as Sarah was talking about the project wide resources, so. The project's information standard um, and, and the various other resources that sh each lead appointed party get should drive um, the consistency if every, each lead appointed party is producing a BEP individually. Um, and actually, we suggest in the guidance good practice, assuming all of this is set up in the common data environment, you know, as, uh, as part of the tender response phase, um, wouldn't it be sensible if, you know, each, each lead appointed party organization? Had a bit of a cross communication and sharing, um, you know, how they're developing their their BIM execution plan, so there is that consistency. Um, but you know, go again, we can't contradict the ISO itself. Um, that's a requirement for a lead appointed party in the in the ISO. I think also, Andy, the the ISO is concerned with how information is going to be generated and authorised and, and and then accepted up the chain back to back to the client so they're concerned about that th that delivery team there is that activity of coordination across delivery teams and of course that's something that you've got to be mindful of or, or planning very carefully when you're when you're a lead appointed party but the the, it, the client is concerned with how information is going to be exchanged and authorized so that they can accept it and that's going to come up through specific delivery teams okay thank you um can you designate a lead appointed party per phase of the project so, so, the, the, so that's an interesting question and uh the, the, if whether or not you're a lead appointed party is all about your appointment relationship so you could find that if you think about a project, you could, and, and particularly if you're a, a d design consultant, you could find that for a phase of the project, you're a lead appointed party because you're appointed directly by the client. But in a design and build scenario, you could find that your, uh, your appointment is then novated to a client. So you actually end up, for part of the project being a lead appointed party, and for part of the project being an appointed party. Yep. Very good point. Yeah. And I think there is there is um uh, an image in the part two guidance that explains that very scenario. Okay, continuing with multiple lead appointed parties, why is it called a master information delivery plan where there can be sem several? Also, who is responsible for coordinating the multiple into the particular project program? So, I mean, I'll start on that in that, yeah, so if, again, if you think of each lead appointed party being the lead appointed party for a delivery team, um, each delivery team needs to submit a, their master information delivery plan. Um, so, so you would, you know, in the case of multiple lead appointed parties you would have a number however many lead appointed parties we'd have that amount of MIDPs 
Um, but again, consistency from client side, it would be up to them to understand and, and look across um, those MIDPs. Um, Rob, do you want to elaborate on that at all or Sarah? No, I mean, I think, you know, again, a lot of this, what we should be clear about is here is we're providing guidance to the ISO, um, you know, which our, our job here is to interpret or to help interpret the the ISO into clear guidance to support that and you know that I think it's fair to say that we probably all have our own views on on this particular um, subject matter but I think the important thing is that we're not changing really what happened traditionally you know project managers who were directly appointed by a client or, or a designer would probably do some of this work and what we're trying to do here is improve the information management of that project you know, in terms of who manages the program, well, the program probably wouldn't change. You know, the project manager is probably managing a program in a DMB where th there's a design team to start with, and then it's probably the contractor later on to take that information. The important thing here is to is to plan to plan your information delivery and to feed it into the people who need that information. I think what we became clear here is that lead appointed parties will often need to talk to each other and will need to have a coordinated view ultimately. But you can only do that when you have have this information to hand. Yes, that's a good, good point. The other point is that the, the ISO isn't reflecting what we do now. It's trying to um, move us along a little bit. So yeah. it, it, there are elements that might not sit comfortably with current practice. Uh, and it's all about trying to elevate that current practice so that it has uh, a very clear on information uh, focus on information just like there's always been a very clear focus on activities and delivery mm. and I think I like the last point is again if, if you know let's say client there's multiple let's say there's two big delivery teams on the scheme um, with obviously two key lead appointed parties there two MIDPs the client um, information manage whoever's performing the information management function for the client whether it's an in internal or a third party they would be looking across you know those two master information delivery plans or however many and and relating it back to project delivery and and, and the program yeah okay thank you um rob maybe you can take this one clients struggle to generate eirs etc under beam level two with the need to make resources appointment specific i.e not just on one er but potentially several do we expect clients to cope with this this the person who's asked the question isn't disagreeing with the principle but just wondering how well it will be implemented i think as sarah touched on you know this is about promoting best practice going forwards and i think you know it's clear through uh, over a number of years that writing detailed requirements is um, a challenge for certain client organizations some who only build once other organizations who build multiple times it's perhaps a little bit easier but as we talked about in the presentation uh, it's about understanding the competencies within your own organization so if a client doesn't have individuals who have the, com the, the right the competencies to to write those requirements then you know they can seek the um, assistance of a third party or third parties to help develop their information requirements and some of that might be going and uh, writing an EIR with a particular consultant but equally you know there are specialist security consultants who can help around security aspects and I think yes you you know the idea is that you can build templates for uh, a client but you will need to make them specific for projects and again you need to do that and I, I think one of the things that became very clear um, is that the whole point of the ISO is that the information management function comes first and that means that your information manager or managers or whoever you want to deploy to do that role uh, are actually appointed even before potentially project managers or any any other team members so setting that up before a project starts is what you know is the goal it doesn't happen today and we're not saying it does um, we're saying that there needs to be a change in focus here and what it will actually do is give a much clearer picture to uh, whether it's a contractor team bidding or whether it's designers bidding to um, be able to bid much clear, more clear about what is actually required to deliver those client requirements so you know if you need to get help to to, to write them then you've got to go and get help to write them I, I don't think that that's um, you know that's pretty standard and there are government departments asking for help and there are individual organizations asking for help and 
um, obviously that's something I do for a living but I think you know there are plenty of other people who can who can help do that I think there are plenty of good resources you know we've talked about um, what the UK uh, BIM Alliance and the UK BIM Framework are doing and uh, you know uh, we're talking about I think there's a, a tender out at the moment um, to to look at that developing sort of um, best practice uh, information requirements and it will continue to evolve obviously there's another session specifically on information requirements uh, as part of this UK BIM Framework uh, webinar series. I, th I think as well that exchange information requirements are quite a different beast to EIR which we've seen over the last few years sort of contain anything and everything to do with information and now that the resources are distinct between those that are project level and those that are appointment level so we've got the projects information standard and the information production uh, the information delivery production methods and procedures I think it, it enables clients really to think about who is best placed to what to author these resources and maybe one one part of the organization can can also one element of resources but also um, resources like the exchange information requirements which could be effectively a database to of specific information deliverables that might be authored by another party but it is you know it is um it i suppose it is a, a, a skill and expertise in itself it's something that has to you, you have to have the right competency to be able to to do a good job so a follow-on question um, would there be a would there be a benefit in setting the process and documents in a timeline format say against the reba stages to show what happens and when um, yeah, well I, I perhaps come on at, at that so they don't just it's appointment driven and lead appointed parties are appointed throughout REBA stages. So whilst you would develop your project level information resources um, at the very start of a project, the appointment level ones will, will be being developed to support appointments. So you might find that you're developing exchange information requirements in stage four to support the procurement of a contractor, but exchange information requirements towards the back end of stage one to bring in an architect into stage two. So it, it is purely about being appointment driven, not stage driven. And that, that allows flexibility for other um, procurement routes and, and milestone stages as well, doesn't it? So it does, yeah. yeah, I mean, it'd probably be a useful exercise to, to map out some of this stuff typically for some of, some of the key um, milestone deliveries. But again, uh, the ISA has to be agnostic in terms of procurement route and its appointment. Yeah level driven as Sarah said. Um, thank you. Questions are coming in quite a bit now. Um, so does the framework provide examples of the appointed resources such as the MIDP, the TIDP and the responsibility matrix for example? It, it yes, does. <laughs> so it does and um, actually I think it's guidance part F which, yeah. which brings up examples of the MIDP and TIDP and John Ford will be covering that and just in respect of exchange information requirements there is a database example in the uh, on the UK BIM framework website but guidance part D contains uh, qu quite a lot it, it contains examples around six different scenarios so there are examples there okay thank you um so this is more of a generic one around part two and part three so iso 19650 part three is so this is what this questionnaire has stated the iso 19650 part three is an improvement of iso 19650 part two Although part two is meant for delivery phase and part three for operational phase, there is too much repetition, repetition and the minor differences are only contributing to the complexity. Then there's a, a list of examples. However, the question at the end is, um, with uh, everything being resolved in part three where OIRs and AIRs are included, does this make the publication of part three render the publication of part two uh, um, is that render the publication of part two irrelevant yes does it make right. it irrelevant 
No, because what what part two is doing is explaining the processes that you need to have in place to deliver information against a project. And part three um, is supporting the operation. And I suppose it comes down to in part three, what what's the what then becomes a project? So if you're in part, th if your organisation, you're managing information and you're managing it according to part three, part three references trigger events. And one of if one of those trigger events is actually turns into a, a, a project, then you would go back to part two. So they sit hand in hand, really, um, but, but they have very specific purposes or very not purposes, but a very specific focus. Yeah. You should, you should also mention, you know, the part part one effectively has the description of how those kind of things interact. So the asset information requirements, the OIR part, feeding into uh, the EIR, so that the EIR is, is project specific. And uh, uh, as Sarah mentioned, you know, the part three is could be much more focused on even just a, a trigger event like, you know, going and having to replace the boiler. It's not necessarily a project in itself. I think it, it's inevitable, though, when these standards are developed slightly uh, apart, that there's going to be lessons learned, if you if you like, applied perhaps to, to later standards. That we've, we've seen that in the UK in terms of how the PAS and the BSs were developed, in that there's always lessons learned. And I'm sure that over time, part two will be revisited to um, tidy up or, or improve certain aspects that could be learned from, from some of those later standards. I think, though, we should remember here that the, the guidance is very... You know, this is about the guidance supporting those those standards, and the standards are happening, um, you know, slightly somewhere else. Although you know, some yeah. of some of those producing the guidance are involved in in the in the standards themselves. Just just to add a tiny bit to that, as when I'm watching David Church um, talk about part three, you know, there's a deliberate it's deliberately um, drafted so it reads the same as part two where it can. So there's commonality, and I think because one of the criticisms is getting from 1192 part two and then part three was a very different documents and that was obvious um mm. so hopefully it doesn't you know it duplicates where where it where it should be and it should be useful and provide commonality but then it's different obviously in the context okay. of the operational phase thank you um like i say we have had a fair few questions coming we could go on for a couple of hours but we're not going to i'm <laughs> conscious of time one final question to all of you um but just before that if you did ask a question and it hasn't been answered we will do that offline so don't worry about that so one final question is as practitioners do the speakers experience the iso process being split in project stages or are the documents set at the start of the project and followed through all project stages? So can I ask you, Rob, to comment on that one first? Uh, it's a very, I suppose, um, yeah, an organisational thing. I mean, we've been applying ISO 19650 now since um, the beginning of last year and all of our projects are set up uh, as per the part two um, and that's kind of standard. Now we're still seeing projects that require in level two and, and mentions of PAS and the BSs and we try and effectively uh, convert those projects as much as we can um, while still you know aligning with EIRs um, uh, we're trying to apply it to as much as we can uh, or we can't always because uh, appointments have already been made um, but we do our best to to try and push uh, forward with using the new standards and the, and the new processes because that that is current best practice and we will always try and apply best practice wherever we possibly can um, we can't always do that and we've got many projects where um, we're kind of you know fixed or set in stone but we will always try and promote you know new terminology and and, and that new approach where to to everyone else that uh, you know will will want to listen and will want to understand even if it's a uh, applying an old process and saying this is what you would do if you were applying the, the new processes Thanks, Rob. Sarah? Um, so, do, remind me of the question again. My memory is not I was going to ask the same, don't worry. <laughs> so, uh, do the speakers experience the ISO process being split in pod project stages, or are the documents set at the start of the project and followed through all project stages? So, uh, definitely in my, in my experience, we've looked to develop the project level resources at the very beginning of the project. Uh, to support the whole project but 
we know that those project level resources they are subject to review and so they can evolve throughout a project and and they will evolve especially when you get um more parties joining the project uh so that you can you understand uh for example how their information is going to be referenced so there's that element of of starting off right at the very beginning trying to get all of the project level resources in place and certainly um the exchange information requirements which are appointment specific it's worth and guidance part d talks about this a lot although they're appointment specific you've got to be able to coordinate and, and understand who's going to deliver what information so it's quite helpful to start off by generating um a master set of exchange information requirements and then assigning those exchange information requirements to appointments so that you can filter them on an appointment basis so I would start off working at that project level um, or, or having that project wide view on exchange information requirements, but they will inevitably develop because you are going to understand your information requirements at that granular level more as, as the project develops. So I would say it's a mix of, of both. You know, you, you start off with the focus on the project level information, uh, sorry, the project level resources. Um, but you don't have a closed mind about their development over the project. Okay, thank you. And finally, Andy. Yeah. So briefly, um, uh, so so certainly, yeah, expanding what Sarah said, really. And again, it depends what you know what per persona you are in the process. As um, for us, as a as a lead appointed party, main contractor, obviously we've got the joy of appointing a, a whole supply chain. So yes, at the start would be certainly defining our information management function forming our typical exchange information requirements but then you know at each appointment stage throughout the stages as, as we build our supply chain um, we'd be um, developing the required documents and asking for them or resources back from from those appointed parties so it's very very much uh, at an appointment level and moves across the stages to a point thank you um with that, I would want to thank the three of you, Andy, Sarah and Rob, for this webinar. Um, you have mentioned uh, Guidance Part D a fair bit. Um, we have that uh, particular webinar taking place at 12 o'clock today with Emma and Marcia delivering that. Um, and you will see the link that is being shared uh, on the slides there. That is where you can access all of the guidance documents uh, that have been created. Uh, once again, thank you, Rob. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Andy. And with that, we'll end the call. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.